One approach that I always said they should have taken because they have the ability to still spend money is making a trade for a guy on a, the last year of his deal, then paying him after the fact. And I think there's a lot of pitchers in that position. Would you, if you're the Mets next offseason, consider making a trade for one of those Milwaukee pitchers or Freed or Arias or somebody like that? Um, actually, it was just on the show I was on before I was with you guys. We were talking about Corbin Burns for quite a bit. And yeah, I mean, for someone like Burns, who's he made it publicly known he was unhappy um, during spring training, his arbitration hearings. You know, yeah, that's something you look into. And right now the Mets do have, you know, prospects that you can consider trade capital um, to go acquire something like that. And whether the Brewers want to do business with the Mets, that's another question altogether. But, uh, you know, they're, they, they've, I don't want to say they've, uh, they've poached David Stearns, but they certainly borderline tampered with him for a couple of years and, <laughs> Now it's looking like he's coming to the Mets, but yeah, it might be tough to um, to probably Corbin Burns out of them. But yeah, um, you know, you have Sanga, you have Quintana, who's looked really good since coming back. Um, uh, Gary Cohen put a, I mentioned a stat, um, I guess in the Atlanta series, he went 97 and two thirds innings without allowing a home run. Mm. And that's over two spans with the injury in between, over two seasons with the injury in between. But this is a, I don't want to say an ace level or even front of the rotation guy, but if he can be a solid three, even like flashes of a two, that's big. If you can get flashes of a two in a three spot, that's huge. I don't know if the Mets are going to lean on Sanga to be your number one next year. And that, that might be something they really have to consider. You know, it's so funny. You br- you brought up Senga, and I told Speedy, I said, I wouldn't be surprised if Senga is the Mets' best pitcher this year. And he said, why? And we have Verlander, we have Max Scherzer, even though we both think they were at the tail end of their careers. Even though Justin might have some left in him, I think Max is done. But And, I, and I've said that before the, even the Mets brought him in. As a matter of fact, we talk to uh, the Nationals analyst, uh, you know, I think. Roley. <laughs> yes, and she was on the show, and she was complaining. She told me, you don't know nothing, and then Max is going to go to the Mets, and he's, gonna, he's going to tally up strikeouts and all that other stuff. And I said, this isn't the Max Scherzer that the Nationals brought in from Detroit. Trust me, believe me, he's not the same player. And she kept arguing with me, and I said, okay, whatever you say. But I thought Senga was going to have a good year because nobody's seen him pitch. He comes from Japan. This is a kid that has confidence. We all know he likes to get through innings pretty quick. But I, I think it's the second year and the third year is where we figure out if this guy could be a good pitcher in the league. What are your thoughts that you have seen Senga this year, his transition from obviously Japan to the majors? Well, I think the confidence has been, first and foremost, you saw it kind of he he gathered it over those first few starts when he struggled i think getting used to the league getting used to the ball because of course coming from japan it's a different ball the rawlings ball versus i believe it's ssk who does their balls Mm -hmm. there um you know there's an adjustment period uh, probably across the board just learning a brand new league as far as you know scouting reports on players and such once he got his feet wet and once he got he got more and more comfortable you saw him blossom into the confident pitcher that he's going out with now that he's going out as now, you know, we talked about it on the podcast this week, simply amazing. Wherever you get, wherever you get your podcast, <laughs> um, you know, the ghost fork of course gets all the attention and justifiably that thing is ridiculous. It's got, I think the highest whiff rate in the majors for any single pitch Spencer Strider's slider was right up there with it, but they're neck and neck. If you look at Senga's cutter, it's been next to unhittable and it it lets everything else in his arsenal breathe. Like he goes pretty much four seam cutter and the ghost fork. He tunnels like the release points aren't identical, but he tunnels them so that pitchers are absolutely on their heels. They're guessing. And if a hitter's guessing, he's not swinging. He's if he's thinking, he's not succeeding. You want to, as a hitter, you want to be comfortable. And, and, and Sang is making them uncomfortable. Guys are, are looking at a cutter that's coming in a little bit slower than a four seam. This is the ghost fork. So they're going to go low, but it's a cutter. It's just a little bit lower in the zone. It's mm. going to stay up. They're going to pop it up. It, it, he's methodical. 